Gilgamesh and the Roots of Tyranny, Reading an Ancient Text and Questions Posed by Adversity. The subject of this article is Gilgamesh, the hero of the Babylonian epic known by his name and the tyrant of the Sumerian city of Uruk, who scholars believe lived and ruled around the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, between the years 2370 and 2600 BC. It must be said from the beginning that the ideas of this article do not move in the circle of scientific certainty or what resembles certainty, and do not claim the ability to reach conclusive or semi-conclusive results, but rather revolve in the field of possibility, assumption, and questioning, and call for an intuitive vision based on understanding, empathy, and sensing. In an attempt to read that beautiful, venerable, and ancient text and interpret it from a personal and historical perspective and experience it, above all, as an inner experience, and make it an effort to merge or merge with it, so that the horizon of the reading self interacts with the horizon of the Babylonian poet whose name history has preserved for us, which is Sin Likianini. And it is said that he lived around the year 1200 BC, or with the effects of anonymous writers, poets and scribes, who began recording parts of that text with the ancient Babylonian era, from 1984 to 1595 BC. Before it was found in the middle of the century the past in its almost complete Assyrian version, in the ruins of the library of the palace of King Ashurnabal, 668-627 BC. In the ancient Assyrian capital, Nineveh, there is no escape from such a reading or such an interpretation, if it is to be completely precise and in taking into account the conditions that surrounded the recording of the text in its many forms and formats, since it was repeated on people's lips and in their songs proverbs and folk tales. Before it was recorded in its initial form in the form of five Sumerian stories about the king, the handsome, wise man and the mighty, terrifying tyrant, these are the stories that the Babylonians relied on to weave the threads of the wonderful epic. Point one there is also no escape from awareness of the basic differences in vision, times, structures, and historical, cultural, political, social, linguistic, and semantic contexts, etc., between the writing self and the reading self, while remaining cautious in all cases against generalization, projection, and charging the epic and its hero beyond what our concerns and sorrows can bear when it is contained. The message which the ancient writer wanted to convey to his contemporary reader and is still capable of addressing the contemporary reader in our days and extracting the constant element or elements in this message, despite the caveats and mistakes that the modern reader and interpreter might fall into while trying to speak in the writer's language. The ancient one, or he pronounces what was silent about and despite the time gap that separates the two, which is estimated at about 4,000 years for the ancient Babylonian text and approximately 3,000 years for the latest Assyrian text. In addition to the cognitive emotional and cultural disconnect that separates them and the accumulation of layers and layers of mental, religious, social and artistic structures and systems, etc., above the awareness of the recipients who are the inheritors of the ancient Mesopotamian civilization and the children of the Near Eastern civilization in general. Although the attempt in itself is an adventure with uncertain consequences, especially when the one who undertakes it admits the extent of his shortcomings and ignorance of Assyriology, the Akkadian language in which the original text of the epic was written, and that he is neither one of the specialists nor one of those working in history, archaeology, and the jurisprudence of ancient Semitic languages, he it is justified from a purely intellectual standpoint, which allows and even imposes on man to connect to his ancient heritage, return to his roots and first springs, and turn to him with questions, and I do not say with trial, in times of adversity and adversity. Perhaps I also ask the reader's permission to add another justification that might justify the attempt, which is that I translated the ancient epic from the German translation which I felt was distinguished in many ways from the other English and Arabic translations that I had access to point to the epic also inspired a long play in 10 dramatic panels, which it titled, He Who Overwhelmed. The Court of Gilgamesh.3 in addition to a large book in which I quote on modern languages, of course, the Babylonian wisdom texts, which are the intellectual and religious framework surrounding Gilgamesh with diligence in interpreting them through the subjective and historical or hermeneutical perspective that I referred to point four. The aim of this article is not to study Gilgamesh per se, although this does not prevent us from introducing this immortal literary and cultural influence and its influence on the ancient and modern literary and artistic heritage very briefly, shortly. 
Its purpose is to ask him some questions through the recent ordeal, which was a lightning bolt that shook the skies of the Arabs and an earthquake from which the land of their present and future existence trembled. These questions, which both the epic and the ordeal raise in the awareness of the self who is keen to recall her heritage and live with it, and her keenness to renew and transcend it, are limited to the following questions. A. Was Gilgamesh a tyrant? What is the concept of tyranny, 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 or other concepts that revolve around this hellish, ill-fated family? If the epic from the first column of the first tablet confirms his tyranny, arbitrariness, and tyranny, and also praises his beauty, wisdom, and heroism, then what is the nature of the relationship between tyranny and heroism in the mythical and religious framework in which the epic was placed. B. Can it be said that Gilgamesh turned away from his tyranny over his people and his selfish desire for fame, glory, and immortality, or was purified from them after his failure to achieve divine immortality and his conviction at the end of the epic that the only immortality available to mere mortals is work and cultural and social construction? To what extent can we support this interpretation that some scholars have adopted and I have no credit for it? Can we say that the epic serves as a parable about tyranny and ways to liberate it at the same time? See can it be said in the words of the analytical psychologist Jung, that Gilgamesh is considered a prototype or archetype of the eastern tyrant, and that it seeped into the depths of the collective unconscious and then began to appear in different images, expressions, and practices, according to different systems, eras, and contexts. What does this assumption or possibility entail for the tasks of psychological, social, and historical research into the tyrannical personality in our ancient, medieval, and modern history, and in our various heritage texts? Doctor, if it is true that our heritage, at least in the political and authoritarian side of it, or most of it, since the eras of decadence, is a heritage of subjugation and repression, then how do you overcome this heritage? By establishing a heritage of liberation, progress, reason, and enlightenment? Where do we begin after a comprehensive ordeal that requires a determination to radically review and start from the beginning? What is the role of human science in achieving this beginning? That can no longer tolerate complacency or postponement. E. If it is true finally that every action has a thought behind it, and that a random, barbaric and irrational act has an equally random, barbaric and irrational thought behind it, then what are the elements of the intellectual crisis or crises that were behind the aggression, and which the ordeal revealed in its ugliest forms? What is the way to form the Arab mind if this generalization is correct and raise it in a scientific, systematic and rational manner, protecting it from falling into the abyss of the irrational, the inhuman and their destructive madness? Before addressing these questions, we would do well to provide a very brief definition of the epic, its place in human heritage heritage, and its confirmed or potential effects on ancient and modern consciousness. With this extreme brevity, it is inevitable to omit important facts and details that the reader can refer to in numerous sources and literature that constitute a complete library on Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the jewel of Babylonian literature and civilization and the oldest epic known to history. It preceded the Iliad and the Odyssey by more than a thousand years, and it is an integral part of world literature. As previously mentioned, a library of studies was compiled about it, and conferences were held for it. Point five, it has been translated into all living languages, it has 10 translations in English alone so far, in addition to translating it or translating parts of it into ancient languages, such as Hittite and Hurrian, which are now considered dead languages. And it has become an inexhaustible source of inspiration for creative people in poetry, theater, stories, music and ballet. There is not enough space to trace its Sumerian and oral folk origins, or the story of its codification, the discovery of its various fragments, the decipherment and its publication. Suffice it to say that this large poetic poem is composed of eleven tablets the lines of which are filled with holes and gaps, along with a tablet attached to it, the attribution of which is doubtful, and which is known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, or by the first half of its first verse, which is he who saw. It is the only collection of myths, adventure stories, and folk tales that revolved around the character of Gilgamesh and that were passed down hundreds of years before they were written down. Gilgamesh himself as previously said was the king of the Sumerian city of Uruk, Uruk, south of Babylon. He was mentioned in the Sumerian king's record recorded in the beginning of the 2nd millennium BC, 
as the fifth king in the order of kings who ruled this city after the flood, and he was credited with building its great wall, the greatness of which the epic praised at its beginning and conclusion, as being the most important of his glories that guaranteed him a kind of immortality available to humans, after his tragic failure to achieve the immortality that he wished for it and sought it, and was finally convinced that the gods possessed him rather than humans. Space is limited to talk about the epic in terms of its artistic composition, its intellectual contents, and the implications that its poetry, events, and characters especially the character of Gilgamesh himself suggest about the tragedy of man in his anxious existence, his search for meaning and knowledge, his question about the secret of life and death, and his perception of his world and the hereafter of the world. The terrifying underbelly from which there is no hope or return and his constant quest to know himself and determine his limits, his moral struggle with evil and his resistance to death, and his visions and positions that fluctuate between absorption in the source of the present moment and absorbing all its possibilities, as represented by the character of Sidori, the bartender of the God's Bar and the determination to achieve a utopian dream that he ultimately knows is impossible and all of this is in addition to the numerous evidence of ancient Sumerian and Babylonian thinking, his historical, cultural, psychological and social conditions, his traditions, wisdom, dreams and visions that predict his behavior and direction and also reveal his terror of the land of no return and its horrors and his daily life filled with oppression, forced labor, and absolute obedience to the divine ruler of the deified and to the priesthood and the assembly of the gods that rules the universe and the cities and appoints representatives from the minor gods to mediate between him and humans and his political and economic relations with his neighbors and his enjoyment of a kind of primitive democracy represented by the existence of two Shura councils, from the elders and youth of Uruk to whom Gilgamesh returned and asked them for opinion and advice more than once, and his connection with the gods whose anger and revenge he feared, such as Enlil, the god of storms, and the gods whose kindness and sympathy he enjoyed, such as E the god of fresh groundwater, and Shams, the god of the sun and justice, and the beginnings of the encroachment of civilization and urban society represented by Gilgamesh and the temple prostitute, on nomadism and nomadic society represented by Enkid and the wild beast, along with a few glimpses of the sciences of practical wisdom, such as magic, prophecy, interpretation of dreams, rituals of worship, purification from evil spirits, and other indicative evidence, on the ancient Rafiti perception of the world, human beings, and different values. We now come to the brief overview of the epic itself focusing on the events and situations that shed light on the tyranny of its hero, and then his possible purification from tyranny, after the seed of immortality was lost from his hands. The first column of the first tablet begins by mentioning the exploits of Gilgamesh and praising his knowledge, wisdom, and achievements in construction and urbanism. He is the one who saw everything on the borders of the country, knew the seas, was aware of everything, and also penetrated with his sight and insight into the most mysterious secrets. Not only did he possess wisdom and knowledge of everything, knowledge of what was hidden and revelation of secrets, he traveled a long way and brought with him news of the previous eras about the flood. When he became tired and exhausted, he engraved on a stone monument everything he had experienced and suffered. Point six. From the ninth line to the nineteenth line, the epic plays the opening melody, which will also be the closing melody, which is a song of his cultural and urban achievements that immortalized his name in history foremost of which is the impregnable wall of Uruk and the sacred temple of Inanna, the same as Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of love and war. He ordered the construction of the impenetrable wall of Uruk around the sacred temple of Inanna and its Sunni sanctuary. Look at the wall of its wall, whose cornices shine as if they were made of copper. Consider its base for there is nothing like it in human works, and feel the stone threshold which has been in its place since ancient times. Approach Inanna, the shrine of Ishtar, whose work is unrivaled by any subsequent king or equaled by the work of man. And also climb the wall of Uruk. Walk on it, test its foundations, examine its structures, or why it is made of proud bricks, or why the seven wise men did not lay its foundations. 1 Lira, number 1, QS. 919. The text goes on to talk about Gilgamesh's beauty and terrifying strength. The gods completed his creation by adding Shamash, the god of the sun and beauty, and Adad, the god of thunder and heroism, to the extent that his height reached 11 cubits, and the width of his chest was 9 spans. Here we come to the basic characteristic that seems to have adorned his ambition for divine immortality, and the ability to change the inevitable human destiny, and also justified his oppression of his people day and night. Two-thirds of him is divine, and the remaining third is human 
human, his body is lofty, and his steps are majestic like a wild bull, he wakes his flock to the beat of drums, he does not leave the son to his father, nor the virgin to her lover, nor the daughter of the hero, nor the wife of the warrior, therefore, the people of Uruk revolt in anger and they complain and plead to the gods to create a counterpart to him in strength and strength, so they can be distracted from the ongoing conflict, and the city can rest and enjoy tranquility and peace. What is strange is that this complaint expresses fear and admiration in one breath and is mixed with love and horror, as if the helpless victim had no choice but to glorify the cruel executioner. He is its shepherd and yet it is its conqueror of oppression. L1 V2 Q25. The gods respond to the supplications of the people of Uruk, so the goddess orders Aruru to create a rival to Gilgamesh in the struggle, so that Uruk can rest. It creates the wild beast in Kidu, who raises pastures with deer, and competes for water resources with animals, with thick hair covering his entire body, and the hair on his head is like a woman's hair, and he also does not know the country or the people. It happened that a hunter saw him returning water with the animal, so his face froze with fear, and his tongue was paralyzed. He went to his father and told him the story of the man who came down from the mountains and whose mighty strength resembled the fist of Anu, the chief god, and how he stood between him and his catch. He filled in the holes that had been dug and cut my nets that were set up, and his father advised him to go to Uruk to tell Gilgamesh, whose power no one has surpassed, the news of that strong and mighty man, and for the king to order for him, one of the temple's prostitutes to accompany him with him so that she would tempt the wild beast with her temptation, and gain power over him with the power of a mirror that exceeds the strength of a man. The hunter did what his father commanded him and gave him Gilgamesh the prostitute, so he returned with her to the wilderness and they began lurking at a source of water. When Enkidu came with his companions with the antelope and the wild animal, she revealed to him her breasts and the charms of her body. The natural hero was quickly attracted to her and indulged in enjoying her charms for six days and seven nights, and the prostitute was able to teach him the craft of a mirror. As soon as he had his fill of enjoying it and remembered the place where he was born after the woman had made him forget it, he headed to his familiar wild animal. The antelope ran away when it saw him, and his animals that had been raised with him in the wilderness denied him, as the hunter had previously told his father in Gilgamesh. Enkidu felt that things had changed in him, and he did not know what they were yet. As his knees failed him, his strength failed, and he was no longer able to follow his terrified animals, he turned back and sat at the feet of the prostitute and began to contemplate her face and listen to her words. His journey then began from brutality to humanity, and he gained understanding and sensitivity and responded to the prostitute's call for him to take him with her to the walled Uruk, where Gilgamesh full of strength and valor, lives, who like a wild bull, tries his mighty power against the people, L1, V4, Q39 etc. Rather, she was in a hurry to go there after she heard him about the injustice and arrogance of Gilgamesh and he announced that he would ask to fight him and verbally abuse him and he would shout in Uruk. The strong one is me. Whenever you enter a place where you change destinies or systems and laws, the one born in the wilds is of great strength and might. It is as if the epic is trying to say that the pure law of nature is stronger than the arbitrariness of tyrannical rulers and that the justice of nature will prevail over the injustice of the city. She took the whore of the temple, or rather the priestess of L.O.V.E. 7 Shamkit is in Enkidu's hand, just as a mother takes her child's hand and teaches him to walk on the path of humanity and civilization. Perhaps she pinned hopes on him for victory for the oppressed and for justice for her people and her kind from the cruelty of the tyrant who trampled under his feet all laws and customs. She took him with her to the shepherd's house and taught him how to eat bread and drink wine how to bathe and anoint his body with oil and perfume with perfume, and to wear human clothes instead of lion and animal skins, until his sense of solidarity with them and humanity prompted him to chase the monsters that threatened the lives of the shepherds, so they were able to immortalize him, to comfort and safety. Enkidu arrived with his patroness, the priestess of love, in Uruk, after being preceded by premonitions of his coming in two dreams that Gilgamesh told his mother, Ninsen, the wise and all-knowing. The people of Uruk surrounded them, they are the friend who will rejoice in his troubled heart, which has not tasted the taste of friendship, and the companion who will save him in times of distress. The wild man began wandering around the city market, and people gathered around him and stared at him for a long time. They saw in him the equal to Gilgamesh that they wished for, and they saw in him the strength and courage to fight the goring bull and the beautiful and wise hero, and they rejoiced. 
Rejoicing in the appearance of the hero who would distract them from them and relieve them of his oppression, the two heroes met when Gilgamesh was about to enter the house of the goddess of love, Ashkara, Ishtar to play the role of the divine husband in the sacred marriage, which was celebrated to herald the arrival of fertility, prosperity, and the germination of crops. Enkidu intercepted the hero to prevent him from entering the temple, Gilgamesh became angry and attacked him, and the two clashed in front of the people. Enkidu blocked the door with his foot, preventing Gilgamesh from entering. There they grabbed each other and wrestled like two bulls. They shattered the doorpost and the wall shook, and when Gilgamesh bent his knee, with his foot firmly planted on the ground, his anger exploded, and he turned his chest, L2. Q215 to 229. The conflict ended with Gilgamesh's victory and his conviction at the same time of the strength of his opponent. He wanted to leave, so Enkidu spoke to him and praised his strength and his worthiness for kingship, and they kissed each other and entered into a friendship the likes of which we rarely find in world literature. One day, Gilgamesh revealed to his friend Enkidu his desire to travel to the cedar forest, to cut down the trees and kill the giant Humbaba, who was guarded by the angry god of storms, Enlil. Thus, they could erase evil from the earth and bring the wood that his country needed to complete construction and urbanization work. Enkidu, who knows the paths of the forest and its dangers, warns him not to venture on this journey. Out of love for him and to protect him from the horror of the fight with Humbaba, whose roar is the flood, whose soul is the roaring death, and whose mouth breathes fire, L2, Q113-114. But Gilgamesh insisted on the adventure even if he went alone, and he assured his friend and his mother, who also warned him of the consequences of risking himself, that he wanted to raise his name, and if he fell in the fight, people would say about him, Gilgamesh dared to fight Humbaba the Terrible, L2, Q149. The necessary preparations for the journey were made, swords, shields, and axes were made, and Gilgamesh went to the council of the city's elders to ask their permission to travel and to inform them of his intention to meet the terrible Humbaba, whose name is chanted by mouths in the land. In order to defeat him and establish for himself an immortal name and prove that the son of Uruk is strong and brave, L2. Q180-187. The elders refused to agree with his opinion and warn him of the dangers as his friend and his mother warned him. Even if they failed in the face of his insistence, they were forced to bless his travel and pray for his safe return. They advised Enkidu to go in front and protect him. Then the two friends went to the mother of the ambitious king to glory fame and the immortality of the name. The wise mother blessed him and prayed for him to the god Shamash, who gave him a troubled heart, and urged him to leave on a far journey and enter into a battle whose consequences he did not know, in order to wipe out from the country every evil he hated, L3, V2, Q10-18. Then she bequeathed to Enkidu, as the elders had done, and gave him a necklace of precious jewels to be a document of his and a covenant. The text is perforated and distorted by a large gap that destroyed the first five columns of the tablet, the fourth of which scholars believe contained the detailed description of the trip of the king and his friend and their experiences in Gate Al Cedars. However, a small fragment remained from which we understand that they found a guard at the door of the enchanted forest and killed him, and that Enkidu had been temporarily paralyzed by the door, making him hesitate to penetrate the forest and confront the terrifying monster, and then Gilgamesh, whose confusion and concerns were not concealed in the epic, encouraged his friend, and repeated to him what he had said before, if the strong man walks in the forefront, alert and careful, he protects himself and protects his companion, and if he falls, his name is immortalized, L4 V6 Q37-39. The first three columns of the fifth tablet describe the two friends' absorption in contemplating the beauty of the forest, the peaks of its mountains, and the tops of its trees, and the three dreams that Gilgamesh saw, whose heart was troubled by fear of meeting the terrifying monster, and his good friend's interpretation of them in a way that brought peace to his heart and good news of victory over him and their prayer to Shamash to support them and stand by them. When Gilgamesh began cutting down trees with his axe, Humbaba heard the noise, became angry, and threatened the unknown bird who dared to disgrace his trees, the daughter of his mountains. It seemed that fear gripped them, so they heard the heavenly Shamash ordering them to come forward and not be afraid. The divine shepherd was not satisfied with that, but rather he subjected them to the powerful winds of all kinds, which struck Humbaba in the eyes, until he was unable to advance or retreat, so he fell into 
into his hands and surrendered and began to beg Gilgamesh to release him. And the hero's heart was about to soften for him, so his friend advised him not to keep him. He was not safe from his evil, and he urged him to cut off his head with his sword. Thus the evil was wiped out, and the mountains and the high places were at rest. L5 P4. The two friends returned to Uruk, with Gilgamesh intending to celebrate the great victory. He cleaned his weapons, washed his body, let his hair down his back, and put on a luxurious, embellished cloak that he tied with a belt. When he placed his crown on his head, the beautiful, venerable Ishta raised her eyes, saw his beauty, and offered him to give her the abundance of his power, and to become her husband and she to become his wife. She did not hesitate to tempt him with all the luxury and honor that could attract men, but Gilgamesh mocked her bitterly. He began listing her crimes against her former lovers, whom she had betrayed, disowned, or distorted in hideous images. Ishtar became angry and was hurt by the injury to her dignity to the point that made her ascend to the sky and ask her father, Anu the chief god to agree to her revenge on Gilgamesh and to hand her the reins of the heavenly bull, so that he could destroy Uruk and its people and spread destruction throughout it. The father gave in to his stubborn, humiliated daughter's desire, after he was reassured that she had saved enough grains and fodder for humans and animals. The two heroes were able to fight the mighty bull and kill it, and Enkidu responded to Ishtar's curses and lamentations over her heavenly bull, by grabbing the thigh of the stricken bull and throwing it in her face. After Gilgamesh made an offering to his special god and hung the two wondrous horns in his chamber, his victorious procession set off with his friend through the streets and markets of Uruk, and people gathered to greet them, and the hero began calling to them, saying, Who is the most wonderful of men? Who are the strongest heroes? Everyone responded in one voice, Gilgamesh is the most wonderful of men. Gilgamesh is the strongest of heroes. L6, number 1, S 182-185. Thus Gilgamesh imagined that he would immortalize his name and mention him among the heroes, and he defeated the giant who filled the country with terror and evil, and killed the bull in a magnificent display. Before the masses of the people in Uruk.80 was reassured that he was still the strong, beautiful hero who captivated the hearts of beautiful people. First and foremost among them was the goddess of beauty, Ishtar. But he did not realize that the goddess of love whom his love had made orphaned was the same as the goddess of war, and that her vengeance against him would befall the only person who was good with his humanity and whose heart was fluttering with his friendship. His friend himself saw in a dream the beginning of the tragic end that the gods had made for humans and for himself, which is the death around which the epic revolves, and which Enkidu began to feel creeping in his feverish body and mind that was devoured by delirium, so he remained in his final sickbed and began to pour curses on the hunter's head. And the priestess of the temple, and love, and everyone who caused him to be torn from his natural life with antelopes and lions and zebras. His illness became more severe, and in his feverish dreams, he saw frightening images of the world of the dead, whose inhabitants were deprived of light, where dust was their food, clay was their sustenance, and they were covered with garments of feathers like birds, L7, V4, Q36-39. Enkidu died, and Gilgamesh became mad and did not believe it, he called him, but he did not answer him, he put his ear to his chest and did not hear the beating of his heart. He refused to hide in the dirt, hoping that his cries would wake him from his sleep. He was unable to accept the painful truth until the worm fell on him and fell from his nose. He wept bitterly, gathered the elders of the city and began to lament. The axe in his sight, the sword in his belt, the armor that protects him. His joy in the garment of his festival, L8, V2, pages 4 to 6. He began listing his exploits and achievements, and the hardships that he had struggled to overcome while wailing and mourning. What kind of sleep has fallen upon you? Darkness has enveloped you, and you no longer hear me. 8 Lyra, V2, Q13 to 14, but Enkidu did not open his eyes. So he covered the face of a friend, as one would cover a bride's face, and began circling around him like an eagle, like a lioness whose cubs have been kidnapped. He went back and forth, plucking out his loose hair and throwing it on the ground, tearing off his beautiful clothes and throwing them away. As if it were something cheap or undesirable that cannot be touched, L8, V2, Q1822. After he ordered the craftsman to sculpt a statue of his friend, its chest would be made of lapis lazuli and its body would be made of gold. He put on the skin of a lion, left his palace in his city, and began to wander in the prairies and deserts, searching for his immortal grandfather, the man of the flood, Utna Pishtim to ask him about the secret of his obtaining immortality, terrified by the luck of mankind, that caught up with his brother and companion in adversity and affliction. 
Not believing that it was possible to turn like him into dust, the epic starting from the ninth tablet goes on at length to recount the horrors faced by the depressed hero who aspired to immortality, or rather to escape the human lot that had not escaped him, as if he was going through the tragic experience of searching for what he is as a human being and on behalf of every human being. Then the epic, which reached the climax of the tragedy, depicts the stages of his disappointed quest for the impossible hope of immortality. After a long and arduous journey, he arrives at the gate of the twin mountains of Mashu, where the sun sets and rises. His guards, who are made up in the form of men scorpions, warm to him, and they allow him to enter after their elder and his wife know his nature, which is compassed of the flesh of the gods, and that two-thirds of his divine, and the rest is mortal human, as the epic emphasized from the beginning. He entered through the huge gate, and found himself in a long, dark tunnel. He continued his walk in complete darkness, not seeing anything around him. Then a glimmer of light appeared to him after he had traveled countless double hours. He finally emerged from the tunnel to find himself in a lush garden. Its branches were heavy with wondrous fruits made of precious stones, from which dazzling lights and enchanting colors radiated. Then he continued walking until he approached a secluded tavern on the coast of the Sea of Death and Darkness, run by the young barmaid whom the gods had appointed for them to visit and drink from her hand from time to time. Sidori saw him from afar, and the sight of his disheveled, dusty face frightened her. She thought he was a murderer or a bandit. She closed the door on her and did not open it until he threatened to destroy it. She became certain after she realized his divine nature and heard the story of his troubles and the reason for his sadness and depression that he was delusional searching for immortality. She tried to rid him of his illusion and offer him the alternative, which is the immortality of the fleeting moment. But he rejected the hand extended with the shining cup and did not heed her advice, which is difficult to forget. Where are you going, Gilgamesh? The life you are looking for will not be found. When the gods created humans, they allotted death to humans and took life into their hands. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your stomach. Enjoy yourself. Make your days holidays, dance and play day and night. Clean your clothes. Wash your head and take a shower. Have compassion for the little one who holds your hand and let the wife rejoice in your embrace. This is the lot of mankind on earth L10 V3 Q114. Siduri offered Gilgamesh an alternative immortality, or rather a kind of fleeting immortality, if the irony of the expression may be permissible, but he rejected it. Did he think that it was a fleeting immortality that would not last forever like the immortality he set out in search of? If we imagine that he accepted the fleeting moment of immortality which Faust rejected, would this not mean that the tragedy would lose its justification and meaning, and the curtain would be drawn on it while it was still at its peak? Wasn't his acceptance of the eternal moment cup a kind of surrender and preference for comfort and abandonment of the dream? No matter how impossible it may seem to him or to us. Then, did the bartender say something new to him, or did she, in fact, remind him of an ancient Mesopotamian wisdom and of what he himself said in his conversation with his friend Enkidu, who, my friend can ascend to heaven? Only the gods are immortalized on their thrones with Shamash. But the days of mankind are numbered, and everything they do is an empty wind. L2, V5, Q140-143. So let him go on in the midst of tragedy and continue his futile quest as we say today for impossible immortality, whether we imagine that he wanted to obtain it in this situation to satisfy his personal ambition, or we imagine that he began the experience of partial purification of his inflated, heroic ego and the transformation into we share in this immortality, or are at least convinced that it is not impossible for a human being who is sincere in his effort to obtain it, Gilgamesh continued his search, which we cannot say at this point felt like a fruitless search. Siduri took pity on him in the end and directed him to a navigator named Urshanabi, who worked in the service of his immortal grandfather after he pressed her with his desire to reach him to ask him about the secret of life and death. Gilgamesh crossed the waters of death with the help of the mariner, who in turn spared no effort in discouraging him and dissuading him from the adventure he warned him of its futility. Gilgamesh reached the island of the living which the gods had designated for his immortal grandfather father to reside there with his wife as a reward for saving life and the living from breaking the flood. When Gilgamesh meets his immortal grandfather and answers his question about the reason for his face atrophying, his heart becoming depressed, his features fading, and sadness taking over, and after Gilgamesh repeats to him what he had previously said to the bartender and the boatman, 
about the death of his friend, who was afflicted by the fate and fate of humans, and his terror or the terror of the human third from him, from being overtaken by the same fate and becoming dust and never waking up from his sleep, we find him, at the beginning of the eleventh tablet, which he devotes entirely to narrating the story of the flood in all its famous details, we find him expressing his astonishment or disappointment at this grandfather whom he sought, and endured horrors and hardships to know, from him is the secret of immortality, he imagined that he would face a mighty hero and prepared himself for a struggle with him, then he saw in front of him an inert man lying on his back like a drug corpse, he discovered that his appearance did not differ from his own and even his arm did not move against him, that is why he exclaims to him in amazement before immersing himself in the story of the flood, tell me, then, how did you enter into the group of gods and attain immortal life, 11 lira, s27, can we say that Gilgamesh realized that his grandfather even before he heard the story of the flood from him, had an immortality devoid of life, or that his and his wife's eternal survival, did not grant them the quality of immortality that he wished for himself, and he took pains and misery to ask him about it, this is just an intuition for which we do not claim certainty in any way. What is important about this brief and imaginative presentation is that he listened to the details of the story of the flood that you know from the book of Genesis and the Torah and from the Holy Quran, just as it was known to a large extent to the Sumerians and Babylonians before the Babylonian writer collected it and added it to his epic. The immortal grandfather came out of the ship after everything that had happened and what he had seen from the porthole of his cabin and he made offerings to the gods that crowded around like flies and Enlil came asking in anger. How did a single soul escape from destruction when he had decreed that no one would be saved? But in the end he joined the consensus of the gods and he boarded the ship and took Utnapishtim by the hand and put him and his wife on board. He touched their foreheads and blessed them, saying, Utnapishtim was never but one of the sons of men. Let him resemble us, the gods, from now on, Utnapishtim and his wife, and let us live far away at the mouth of rivers. Then the man of the flood concludes his long and arduous story by saying, But who will reunite the gods for you now to find the immortal life you are looking for? 11 Lyra S 189-198 It is as if he is addressing the human being in Gilgamesh by saying, you will not attain the immortality that I attained, except through a great sin like the one that burdens my conscience, which is that the human race perishes and you alone remain alive. What is strange about Utnapishtim is that he reminded him at the beginning of their meeting about the annihilation of everything in lines that are difficult to forget and difficult to imagine coming from him. Cruel death has no mercy. Shall we build a house that will never perish? Shall we seal a contract that will never fade? Will brothers divide an inheritance that will last? Will hatred pervade the earth forever? And the flood waters continue when the river is filled and covered, and the dragonfly no, no mortal face has the opportunity to look at the sun and always gaze at it and the sleeper and the dead, how much they resemble each other. Does not death appear on the face of the sleeper and the dead? L10, V4, Q25-34. I say that it is really strange for the immortal grandfather himself to distract him from the idea of immortality, to explain to him its impossibility from a purely human perspective, and to warn him of the high price it costs him which is the destruction of humanity, as if he feels in advance that he will not bear this terrible burden, no matter how much it leads to abandoning his ambition and sacrificing his dearest dream. Perhaps the immortal man of the flood was thinking about something of this when he put the ambitious dreamer to a quick test, Based on the truth established by the last lines that we quoted a moment ago, he asked Gilgamesh to refrain from sleeping for six days and seven nights. Perhaps someone who resists sleep can resist death, which is similar in appearance, at the very least. The hero who has not yet abandoned his ambition is proud and accepts the challenge, hoping to win the bet and win immortality. He quickly fell asleep and fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up, he discovered that he had slept for six days, which his grandfather's wife pointed out on the wall and counted the number with the loaves of bread she placed at his head while he slept. Gilgamesh seems to have realized his failure to stand up to the challenge and pass the test. If we cannot be certain that he completely abandoned his ambition, we can imagine that he fell prey to confusion, loss, despair, and doubt. Let us listen to him say to his grandfather in what sounds like a groan, Oh, what I do, where shall I turn my face? Death resides in my chamber, and wherever I put my foot, death confronts me. L11, S3233. Although death pursues him, pursues him, and includes him from every side, we do not think that he has yielded to it or accepted its reality. 
Although the dream of immortality has begun to seep little by little into the fog, his adherence to his ambition to resist death means no more than his adherence to his nature as a human being and to his absolute and legitimate longing to triumph over it, even if the victory is partial or not absolute. Gilgamesh boards the ship after cleaning himself of the dirt stuck to him and wearing new clothes that will not get worn out on his way back to his city. There Utnapishtim's wife took pity on him and asked him to give Gilgamesh something to take with him to his homeland as compensation for the fatigue and stress he endured during his travel. It seems that the immortal grandfather hesitated a lot before revealing to Gilgamesh one of the secrets of the gods, and that secret was none other than the wondrous thorny plant, which rejuvenates whoever eats from it and restores the old man's youth. Gilgamesh dived to the bottom of the sea in the place that Adnapishtim had specified for him, extracted the magic plant, and was extremely happy with it, to the point that he said in the midst of his ecstasy that he would make the people of his city eat from it to regain their youth. Before he himself thought about eating from it, he and his fellow sailor continued on their way to Uruk, carrying the elixir or effective medicine for aging and mortality. However, the joy did not take place as we repeat today day and night when, on the way, Gilgamesh descended into a well to cool off from the scorching heat and left the thorny plant on its edge, a snake smelled the scent of the magical plant, so it crawled to it and swallowed it, and from that time, it began to renew its skin and youth without the human being. There Gilgamesh sat and started crying. Tears streamed down his face, and Urshanabi spoke to the mariner L11, Q292-296. Why, Urshanabi, have all my arms, why did the heart bleed? I did not gain good for myself, but rather I did good for the lion of the earth, which is the name the Babylonians used to call the serpent. If the crying, heartbreak, and loss echoed by the final cries were the natural ending imposed by the logical sequence of events of the epic, we would say that it is tragic and catastrophic in the fullest sense. If Gilgamesh sitting crying and the tears that ran down his face represented the concluding scene, we would say that it is the scene of acceptance of the inevitable human luck. Perhaps the contemporary conscience affected us with death anxiety, so we imagine that Gilgamesh preceded the existentialist philosophers and existentialists of the 20th century by at least 3,000 years, at the very least, to the truth that they keep emphasizing as if it were one of the most important discoveries of the era in its basic categories, which is the temporality of human existence, its finitude, and the positions that result from confronting it, perhaps the tragic ending of the epic and the tragic nature of the tragic hero Gilgamesh is further confirmed by the fact that this scene explodes sources of black bitterness in the soul of the hero, who was certain of his disappointment and failure to obtain immortality. This immortality, on which, a few lines earlier, he had pinned all his hopes and the hopes of his people. Was it not he who said to Urshanabi the navigator these words that echoed melodies of joy, optimism, hope and victory? This plant cures disorder, and thanks to it, one regains one's life, I will carry it with me to the walled Uruk and give it to the people to eat. Its name is the return of the old man to his youth and I will eat of it, so that my youth may return to me L11 Q377-282. The hope that these expressions do not hide was mixed with a firm determination to share with him the people of Uruk and its elders in particular particular in eating from the plant, and to delay himself from them, not out of altruism alone, but until he reached old age, then the heartbreak and disappointment become extremely tragic and catastrophic, when it is discovered that the serpent has infiltrated the flower of youth kidnapped it, changed its skin, and deprived the human of it, and changing the skin is a legendary symbol of immortality and rejuvenation for many ancient peoples. Whether it is attributed to the serpent or to other animals, gained the ability to control it, but humans lost it after it was within his reach. Point nine. Likewise, the moving cries that he uttered from his heart, the expressions of which we quoted a moment ago, are cries that have justification. And whoever hears or reads them has every right to say that they indicate a process of purification, catharsis for the hero and the recipient, in the full Aristotelian sense of the purification that tragedy brings about. Then we also have the right to agree with those who say that the loss of the seed of immortality was the decisive and final chapter that concludes the chapters of the tragedy of Gilgamesh, who had previously turned into a tragic hero when he discovered his fleeting humanity and his finite temporal existence, especially when he knew death and faced its painful truth through an experience, especially the experience of the death of his only friend Ten and before that, he went through the experience of his continuous failure to triumph over this humanity or transcend it, along with his failure to pass the sleep test that his immortal grandfather, Utnapishtim, and his wife held for him. However, there are those who strip Gilgamesh of the status of a tragic hero, and also refuse to consider the epic a tragedy that seeks to achieve a feeling of purification. 
Those who hold this opinion assert for various reasons that the end of the epic is not a tragic ending in any way, the American Assyriologist Thorka Jacobson says. The epic of Gilgamesh does not reach a harmonious conclusion. Rather, its emotions remain intense and it does not contain any sense of purification as in tragedy or any basic acceptance of the irrevocable. It is a miserable, gloating end that does not cure the sick person as her inner turmoil remains boiling and her vital question remains unanswered. 11 The scholar of Semitics and the history of Arab religions, Muhammad Khalifa Hassan Ahmed, also denies that Gilgamesh is a tragic hero who in the end, surrendered to his human destiny, or surrendered to it, he also refuses to consider heroism in the epic as a tragic heroism. He explains this in a way that refers to the nature of ancient Semitic thinking itself, where he says, The truth is that if the epic ended in a tragic ending, it would be contradictory to the nature of ancient Semitic thinking, which calls for obedience to the gods and belief in their control over human destiny and directs worship to achieving the satisfaction of the gods from by obeying her and pleasing her with offerings and various rituals of worship. 12. In fact, the opinion of both scholars does not deny that Gilgamesh is a tragic hero. The first scholar places the pages he wrote about Gilgamesh in the seventh chapter of the pre-philosophy book on the virtuous life in the land of Mesopotamia under the significant title, The Revolt Against Death. We find this revolution in the epic of Gilgamesh in the form of suppressed discontent and a hidden sense of injustice. This feeling arose from the new idea of human rights and his demand for justice in the universe and in society, as it is a right and not a blessing from the gods, especially after the development and the concept of justice since the ancient Babylonian state and the rule of Hammurabi, the author of the famous law in particular. Point one three. Therefore, Gilgamesh faced death as many Babylonian wisdom writers faced it after that as evil punishment or injustice or even as the greatest injustice. Point one four. Although the wisdom of the Babylonian civilization which Gilgamesh himself repeated in the epic, as well as the man of the flood, Etnopishtim, said as we have seen that death is inevitable, this did not prevent Gilgamesh as a whole from being an epic of man's resistance to death and the attempt to conquer it. Hence comes the tragedy of it that permeates it and touches our hearts to this day, as well as the tragedy of the ending, which Jacobson tried to deny the purification that tragedy brings about, even though he admitted that her emotions remain heated and that her inner turmoil remains boiling. There is nothing tragic about this alone, which we will return to shortly. As for the Arab world, it also denies the tragic character of the end of the epic. Because of his belief which we share that heroism in Gilgamesh was given a new cultural function, it is no longer the heroism of challenge and confrontation against all or some of the gods, nor against the universe and nature and the creatures they contain, nor against humanity, represented by the hero's enemies of his own kind, and the mythical beings that exceed him in strength, and the terror they rouse. The hero has become the human being, the creator of the civilization that represents his path to immortality. Point one five. From this statement, we reconsider the tragic ending that we talked about, and it was not in fact the end of the epic. A careful reading of the text clearly shows us that the epic ends as it began. That is, the beginning is repeated at the end. It is true that the text in the second case was contained in the form of a letter to Urshanabi the navigator, urging him to contemplate the urban and cultural works of the speaker Gilgamesh, such as the famous wall, the temple of Ishtar, and signs or areas of cultivated land. While they were mentioned with the exception of signs, at the beginning of the epic refers to Gilgamesh in the third person, but the meaning in both cases is the same, which is that the remaining works of civilization are the only immortality that suits humans. Before we talk about this cultural significance, we must pause briefly at the text itself. After the heartbreaking cries of despair that Gilgamesh repeated upon his discovery of the loss of the plant, and with it all hope of immortality, L11 Q293-296, we find these three lines, the translation of which the translators differed to a degree, that allows them to be interpreted in different ways. Here the German translation performs it in a way that may be accurate, but it is not without confusion. Now the yam rises a distance of 20 hours double, and I have left the tool. It fell from me when I opened a small channel, so how can I get something like it to put next to me? I wish I had withdrawn and left the ship on shore. 11 lira s 297-299. Firazal Sawa's translation of the same lines gives a performance no less turbulent and ambiguous. When I entered the stream and opened the canal, I found a sign placed for me, declaring my withdrawal. I will leave the ship at the shore. 1611 Lira, 64, S298 300. 
As for the translation of the scholar Taha Bakar, may God have mercy on him, she resorts to an explanatory translation, as she did in many other places, and formulates it as follows. I had previously said that when I opened the water outlets, I found that this was a harbinger for me to give up my demand and abandon the ship. On the coast.17 in all cases, we find the hero withdrawing or abandoning. Did he withdraw or abandon his demand that we are searching for? which is immortality, after he was assured of his miserable failure this time more than any time before? Or does the withdrawal or abandonment that the mysterious lines mention mean abandonment? The ship and walking with the navigator on the land road to Uruk. Whatever the case, some kind of transformation and purification must have taken place here after the plant was lost. If this reading is permissible, then the transformation or purification began in two stages. In the first, Gilgamesh cried, screamed, and released lava of despair from his torn heart. In the second, a period of time passed that allowed him to contemplate and catch his breath. This period of time was no less than 20 double hours, during which he ate a little food with his travel companion and another 30 double hours, that is, several days, after which they stopped to spend the night before resuming their journey and arriving at the outskirts of Uruk. Here we find the popular writer, with the simplicity and spontaneity that we have always been accustomed to, the distance from analysis and reasoning, the reduction of times, events and facts concentrating and merging them together, highlighting certain aspects or events that have important connotations etc. 18 we find this writer suddenly jumping to Gilgamesh's speech to his journey companion. Oh, Urshanabi, climb the wall of Uruk, walk on it, examine its rules, and look at its building blocks. Was it not made of proud bricks? Did not the seven wise men lay its foundations, etc. L11, Q302-307. Do we understand from the wording of this speech and imperative verbal verbs that include invitation, urging and incitement and interrogative formulas that include pride and pride, do we understand from it that Gilgamesh has extracted the meaning from the loss of the plant and from all previous experiences of failure, and that he has learned what he did not know before? With mature conscious knowledge, which is that construction and cultural work is the immortality of the male, an alternative to the impossible immortality that the gods have taken over from humans, doesn't this speech whose inner expression of joy, astonishment, conviction and reassurance cannot be concealed by any translation, indicate that Gilgamesh has reached the stage of enlightenment after the drama of exhausting research and has become certain of the truth that he went through the experience to prove its veracity. Which is that the path of man is it his work of civilization that preserves his name after his inevitable death? Then, wasn't the mention of his civilizational deeds at the beginning of the epic in the third person a record of his personal glories? Evidenced by the fact that they were compared to his deeds that indicate his tyranny and oppression, and they began with a clear order from above, while the mention of those deeds came at the end of the epic in the form of a speech that indicates a transition from the ego to the we and from asserting the self at the expense of the other, to knowing it in its inseparable relationship with the other. Finally, does this speech almost ignore the differences of place and time, in order to reach every human being? We return to the topic with which we began, which is the tyranny of Gilgamesh. Everything we said about the tragedy of this hero between proof and denial, and about the possibility of him being purified of his tyranny and tyranny, or the tyranny of the idea of immortality and its dominance over him, only brings us back to the basic topic that dominates the atmosphere of the epic from the beginning, which is the tyranny of the hero, the deified one. If what we have said so far about his purification and his preservation of the tragic character until the moment of breakthrough or final enlightenment is true, then this tragedy and that purification were linked at the same time to a change in his concept of heroism, which in turn is linked to the extent of his material and moral tyranny. This means that his purification or liberation developed slowly from one stage to the next, such that purification from the tyranny of the tyrannical ego was coupled with liberation from the tyranny of the idea of personal immortality dominating him, until the last hope for this immortality was lost with the loss of the plant, and he went through his harshest experiences. And a kind of liberation was achieved for him. Al Alabama is above selfish tyranny and immortality, and the eye and soul look to the features of the civilizational building and return to the beginning, which did not realize its meaning until after the epic of contradiction, rupture, and dialectical conflict, which finally opened its eyes to the simple direct truth, which is that the only available immortality for humans, it lies in collective work and civilizational building. We must now briefly monitor this slow development, 
The issue of tyranny is one of the first issues raised by the epic. Although it begins by praising Gilgamesh's knowledge, wisdom and insight, then proceeds to praise his rare works and achievements in building and construction, and then returns directly to portraying him in the image of a strong, beautiful hero whose strength and beauty surpasses all other human beings. It soon presents some clear facts. The indication of his oppression of his people at night and in broad daylight, L1, V1, S13, it is like a wild or goring bull, his steps are majestic, and his weapons are unparalleled. He awakens his subjects to the beat of drums, which raises the anger of the people of Uruk. He does not leave the son to his father, nor the virgin to her lover, nor the daughter of the hero, nor the wife of the warrior. It is true that all these facts and details do not represent tyranny in its terrorist and bloody aspects that we imagine today. Rather, they may have been justified in one way or another within the mythical, religious, social and historical framework in which the epic takes place. Harnessing the people who are awakened by the beats of drums can be justified in light of urban and civilizational goals through the economic foundations that required a certain form of production and its relations under the ancient feudalism that prevailed in the ancient riverine civilizations. Taking the daughter from her father, the wife from her husband and the bride from her fiancé can be understood through the sacred marriage ritual, which allowed some primitive tribes the right of the first night before legal marriage. Point one nine. But do these facts justify people's complaints to the gods and their response to them? Does it not suggest that the writer or writers remain silent about the most horrific and heinous crimes forced or acquiescing to custom and religious tradition that ruled that Gilgamesh should be deified during his lifetime and that he be appointed judge of the souls of the dead in the underworld after his death and then sing praises of his justice, his care for his people, and his people's love for him over hundreds of years is this true if what some references say is true, even if you cannot confirm it, then the people's complaint to the gods comes in one breath with the glorification of his strength and beauty, he is their shepherd and yet he is their conqueror, as if they are placing a laurel wreath and a crown of glory on the head of the hero who is chaining them up or subjecting them to more severe torture. And they are providing evidence of the fearful victim's love and submission to the executioner in whose hand the knife shines. Doesn't this strengthen the possibility of his oppression and tyranny in a way that is greater and more dangerous than what was mentioned in the book of the epic and does not diminish it? These questions remain within the scope of intuition and speculation about the existence of other depths of the text that the censorship of authority and tradition did not allow to be revealed and details and information that scholars have not been able to access but which indicates efficiently at least in the early stage of Gilgamesh's biography, the face of the tyrannical divine and earthly ruler. He who was overwhelmed, in addition to its glorification of the all-seeing and wise hero, he who saw. However, this face was not the only face and its rigid and terrifying features did not remain their rigidity and terror. Various changes and developments occurred to him before he achieved enlightenment or manifestation, which he most likely reached in the final scene we talked about. The concept of heroism, and thus the concept of tyranny, began to change since Gilgamesh met the beast of the wild Enkidu in a physical struggle that did not end, as we have seen, with the former's decisive victory over his opponent, but it resulted in him being convinced to confront a rival in strength and holding a seal. The rare friendship between them, it seems that Enkidu had forgotten his promise to the temple raider to change the order and fate of the city, or the epic writers had forgotten him in the midst of their interest in the joint heroic adventures begun by the two heroes. The reader who followed these adventures remembers without a doubt that the hero of the epic did not abandon his personal ambition for fame and immortality even in situations in which the writers of the epic excelled in portraying his human weakness in the face of him, his supplications to his shepherd, the god Shamash, and the obsessions of his dream which his kind and compassionate friend was quick to explain in a way that contradicts him. Reassurance of oneself, Gilgamesh remains the selfish, tyrannical hero after his victory with his friend over the heavenly bull, perhaps a mythological symbol of drought, desolation, and other natural disasters. He emerged from this conflict more determined to appear as an invincible hero in front of his people, who chanted that he was the strongest and most wonderful of heroes. Rather, he confirmed this negative heroism before that by challenging the goddess of love, Ishtar, and continuing to insult and defame her. Could rejection of love mean anything other than clinging to self-love and fossilization in the shell of the lonely ego? Can a challenge to the will of a goddess come from anyone other than a deity who did not seem to care for a single moment about the devastation that the bull had wrought on the city, the hundreds of people who were struck down by its bellowing? 
and the curses that the wounded goddess of love began to cast upon the head of the city and its inhabitants, not to mention other forms of challenge to various natural forces and to the will of the gods who he knew had immortality in their grip. However, he did not give up his ambition to immortalize himself like them. Until the loss of the magical thorny plant, he maintained his belief that his body was the flesh of the gods, that two-thirds of it was divine, and the remaining third was mortal human. Gilgamesh as we presented goes through the real experience of death when he is surprised by the death of his friend. The importance of this experience does not come only from the fact that it transformed the epic into a philosophical epic revolving around resisting death and confronting human destiny with a determination for personal immortality. But rather it stems before that from the transformation of his awareness into his true self as a human being and the beginning of the intensification of the conflict between the human element, which has become vulnerable to an annihilation due to the law of death. The luck of humans and the divine element that remained attached to the dream of immortality, that guaranteed it to overcome the inevitable fate. Had he not endured this struggle, it would not have been possible for the friend's illness and then death to have shaken him and shake his being with all the depth and impact depicted in the epic, and it would also not have been possible for him to repeat to everyone he met the reason for the atrophy of his cheeks, the depression of his soul and his wandering on his face in the wilderness like a lost wanderer who came from a far journey. Dot this conflict continued to rage within him, even after his meeting with his grandfather, Utnapishtim, and learning of the high price that immortality would cost him. Indeed, his burning embers continued to rage even after his failure to triumph over the twinner double of death, which is sleep, and his desperate cry that death accompanies his steps and lies in his room. However, he did not realize the complete and true awareness of his mortal truth and the loss of immortality for him and his people, and perhaps for all of humanity, only after the loss of the plant the dream and the elixir. Here, the black waterfall of despair exploded over achieving the purpose wisdom or slogan that had been taught to him by his cultural heritage and repeated by his tongue more than once in the epic. It is as if the loss of immortality, the loss of the plant, and the acceptance of the reality of mortality were the final, decisive result to which his exhausting experiments led and were necessary for them, after they had been merely an assumption or a common saying that he represented like other fleeting members of his people. This result turns into something resembling a law or general principle when the final scene comes, as we have seen, to be expressed in a vivid image far from abstraction, an image that is almost one of the miracles of literary and artistic creation. This is because she suggests or calls for that principle at the same time, when she says succinctly, simply, and spontaneously. If you are looking for immortality, like me, then here before you is the wall of Uruk, the pure temple of Ishtar, and the signs of the good earth, which is the only immortality available to mortals like us, I, others like me, and the saga of my struggle are just an example of this only immortality. We have repeatedly talked about the tyranny of Gilgamesh and the possibility of his gradual purification from it, and it is time for us to make up for what we missed and stop for a moment at the concept of tyranny. To try to define it and distinguish it from other concepts with which it is intertwined and belongs as a member of that unholy family, which includes tyranny, autocracy, absolute individual rule, barbarism, anarchy, dictatorship, and totalitarianism in their modern uses and connotations, in addition to the implications that all these perceptions and concepts raise, strong connotations of subjugation, suppression, and control, and the backwardness it generally suggests, have been associated with Europeans since ancient times, with the concept of the East itself. In the levels of liberation, reason, and progress, if not accompanied by their absence at all, in light of the absolute domination of one master over millions of slaves, as Hegel 1770-1831 expressed, in fact, the concepts of tyranny and tyranny are almost intertwined and contemporaneous, especially when we consider them from the Eastern perspective, which concerns us above all others in this context. Each of them casts a negative black shadow over the other and indicates comprehensive control by a regime or individual with absolute power, whether this power is directed to misusing it to achieve the interest of that individual, as is the case with a tyrant, or to using it for the public good and in accordance with the law and the constitution in most cases. In the case of a tyrant, although in some circumstances this does not prevent the latter from turning into a tyrant in the bad eastern or Asian sense. The terms tyranny and tyranny have gone through a long history that attests to their interpenetration to the point of merging and synonymousness, or their divergence to the point of a decisive distinction between them at the hands of philosophers of Western political thought since the time of Aristotle and his famous theory that he presented in his book Politics in particular about tyranny. 
to a large number of great political thinkers who clearly distinguish the concept of tyranny from other concepts associated with it, the most important of which is tyranny. Montesquieu, 1689-1755 AD, was at the forefront of these thinkers. It gave tyranny a special status, made the authoritarian regime one of the three systems of government that it recognized, and helped to permanently replace the concept of tyranny in 18th century France. To denote the system of absolute sovereignty and control in exchange for the abuse of power by an individual ruler, as previously mentioned until the social philosopher Tocqueville, 1805-1859 AD, expressed his opinion in the year 1835 AD that the course of politics in modern society after the French Revolution and the era of empire and the character they took. Both terms tyranny and tyranny were rendered unfit and inefficient for use until the present era came when they became obsolete terms and discussions about absolute systems of government and its various forms centered around the concepts of dictatorship and totalitarianism. Whatever the perception of tyranny and tyranny in particular in the comparison and analysis of systems of government the social history of its forms and practices and in the implicit or explicit expression of the opinions and political biases of those conducting that analysis and history their image was for the most part a negative one. And over the course of eras and circumstances, it turned into a slogan that denotes organizations and measures that oppose political freedom, condemning it and labeling it as a departure from nature, reason, law and truth. Whenever this condemnation reached its extreme, thinkers and analysts resorted to recalling the Eastern model of rule that is, Asian despotism in the first place, which, in their opinion, had reached the furthest imaginable extent in aggression against nature and reason and violation of the law and the constitution. The reason for this is the tyrannical Eastern ruler's acceptance of the slavery of his human subjects and his lack of awareness that man is an inherently free being. It is no wonder then that we do not find sufficient definition of the concepts of tyranny and tyranny in their opposing relationship to freedom and that the forms of government that conflict with freedom are considered simple forms compared to the complex forms that embody freedom and that both Aristotle in his study of tyranny Tyrannus, and Montesquieu in his treatment of tyranny that such forms do not need further saying. This has led most Western political thought philosophers as we mentioned to link their view of tyranny with Asian forms of government and its practices and it also led them to implicitly believe that Europeans, insofar as they are Europeans, free by nature in contrast to the natural slavery of the Orientals. It also led them to engage in logical and human fallacies that contradict the concept of freedom itself. Eastern tyranny has long been taken as a pretext for conquest and expansion and a justification for aggression and colonial control. In fact, attaching the character of tyranny to any enemy even if it is European, it remains a sufficient justification to incite the political or religious group to launch aggression against it and to crush it if necessary. Then the Greeks branded their Persian enemies with tyranny, and Christian writers attached the same negative characteristic to the Muslim Ottoman Turks. It is an irony of time that those who claim freedom against tyranny, or at least their historians, did not notice that such arguments had become available from Aristotle to Hegel, Marx, and Engels. It is the means by which they use a pretext to attack other peoples who, in their estimation, did not enjoy this blessing and to resort to their enslavement under the pretext of liberating them. It was also in my estimation at least the main reason behind the tendencies of religious and racist fanaticism and the civilizational and cultural focus on their images differ among Westerners and Easterners. Some analysts divide the stages of development and diversity in the concept of tyranny, in particular in Western political thought, into seven distinct stages. Perhaps we would do well to point out these stages briefly, before talking in some detail about the Greek theory that concerns us in this regard 20. A. The stage of Greek theory that makes innate slavery the basis of the absolute rule of the Eastern king or ruler, and his subjects view this absolute rule as a legitimate right and agree to it with their consent. B. The late medieval view of tyranny as a type of monarchy, as distinct from other types of monarchy and the rule of a tyrant, or rather his abuse of rule.21. See the new form of this theory in the 16th and 17th centuries, which began with Jean Bowden, 1530-1596 AD, defined tyranny as the form of rule that arises as a result of the right of the victor in a just war to control the defeated, including his right to enslave him and confiscate his property or as a result of the defeated agreeing to be enslaved in exchange for sparing his life and blood, it found its origin in Roman law and greatly influenced the concepts of tyranny by Grotius, Pufendorf, Heise, Locke, and Rousseau. 
Dr. Writers of the 17th and 18th centuries mostly French began by uniting despotism with Eastern systems of government and then changed their perception of the term so that it applied to forms of absolute comprehensive control in any place and time as if their goal was in fact to object to the concentration of power in the hands of the Sun King Louis XIV and his monopoly over it as does the Grand Master or the tyrannical Ottoman Sultan. E. Montesquieu, 1689-1755 AD, conceived of tyranny as one of the three forms or modes of government and government, along with monarchy and republicanism, and his decisive condemnation of slavery and servitude in any form and the, the criticisms directed at the previous conception in the 18th century, and its various effects especially by Voltaire, 1694-1778 AD, who ridiculed Montesquieu's experimental theory of tyranny and the possibility of applying it to the Eastern empires and China in particular which he did not know well, as well as the criticism directed by Anguille Debrun, 1731-1805 AD who in his book Oriental Legislation, 1788 AD, attacked the theory of Eastern despotism, linking it to the Achaemenid state that Aristotle intended. His defense of ancient Eastern civilizations and his exposure of the West's arrogance, ignorance, and greed were, as he says, the result of its establishment. Among the Mahdi in India, from 1755 AD to 1761 AD, and he translated Avesta, the sacred texts attributed to Zoroaster, into French. G. Subsequent developments in the use of the term by Robespierre and Saint just during the French Revolution to justify the tyranny of revolution and the terror of freedom and virtue, then by the writer Madame de Stael and Benjamin Constant until Hegel and Marx, and finally Tocqueville, who confirmed in his book on democracy in North America 1835 AD the inadequacy of the two terms, tyranny and tyranny to express developments in the 19th century. He also imagined the possibility of the emergence of a new form of tyranny that threatens democracy democratic society, which is represented by the tyranny of the opinion of the majority over the opinion of the minority, and the concentration of all the forces of the people in the grip of an individual or body, who are not held accountable or asked for their actions, as happened during the horror of the French Revolution and during the era of the empire, as we mentioned before. We will limit our discussion to the Greek theory, which sheds light on the concept of tyranny and its relationship to Eastern tyranny, and it is what concerns us before anything else, as previously said. The word tyrant despots in Greek indicates three meanings, the first of which is the head of the family or the head of the family, the second of which is the master of slaves, and the third of which extends in the political term to include a type of royal rule in which the king's authority over his subjects is similar to the authority of the master over his slaves. Even if the governed view is legitimate and approved by customs and traditions. In this regard, Aristotle says that the authority of the politician, politicus, is exercised over free people by nature, while the authority of the master is exercised over slaves by nature, politics, 1, 1255b. This means that tyranny and slavery apply to a specific model of the relationship between humans and that this model is not worthy of a society of free people. Since the beginning of the long wars that took place between them and the Persians, the Greeks imagined that tyranny was a set of systems and traditions specific to the barbarian peoples that is, non-Hellenic peoples whom they considered slaves, of course, and that it was a form of royal rule practice by the Asians. The blatant example of which was represented by the Achaemenid kings of the Persians from 538 to 331 BC. During the wars that took place between them and the Persians, the Greeks felt disgusted by the image of these solar kings who embody divine law and thus absolute rule. While they were proud as Herodotus states that they were free because they were subject to the laws of the city-state, not to any ruler. An Asian to whom his subjects prostrate and kneel, free people do not bow down to mortal men, and the only earthly tyrant they can acknowledge is the law to which they have willingly agreed, as Socrates put it in his famous defense and in his dialogue with Credo. Thus, the term tyranny acquired its fourth meaning, which we find in Herodotus, Xenophon, and Plato. Aristotle, more than any other Greek writer, was interested in explaining the term and comparing it with tyranny, and his theory of tyranny had a significant impact on political thought so much so that his name came to mind immediately upon hearing the word. He asserts that Asian tyranny is not based on force, nor does it come from the fear of the ruled of their deified ruler. The reason for this is simple, 
they willingly agree to him enslaving them. Add to this that tyranny is a form of constitutional monarchy, which is originally based on the king's respect for prevailing law, not on asserting his arbitrary will. Moreover, authoritarian regimes do not know the problem of the ruler who succeeds the tyrant in power. Because it is characterized by stability and constancy unlike regimes of tyranny that face coups or, say, sudden fluctuations and the tyrant may resort to seeking the help of foreign forces to suppress the opposition of the ruled politics. 3. 9. 1286a. What concerns us in this context is that Aristotle linked tyranny with tyranny which made his words about it, i.e. about tyranny, carry a meaning of condemnation and accusation. Although the authority of the Asian kings is a royal authority, because they rule according to the law and with the consent of the governed, but it is also a tyrannical authority, because they rule in a tyrannical manner that expresses their own whims and judgments on matters, al Sayasa 4 8, 1295a. In his connection between tyranny and tyranny, Aristotle goes so far as to establish similarities between them, when he discusses discusses the means of tyrants such as Periander, the ruler of Corinth and one of the seven sages in extending their rule, which, in his opinion, are the same means that the kings of the Persian Empire resort to, politics, 5, 9, 1313a. Although the tyrant rules according to the law, he does not rule in accordance with the common good. Likewise, all systems and constitutions that are exploited for the benefit of the ruler carry an element of tyranny, while the polis, i.e. the Greek city-state, is a common group of free people who are linked together. The bonds of friendship and justice politics, 3, 4, 7. However, these ties do not exist if the common element between the ruler and the ruled is absent, as is the case under tyranny and tyranny, where the relationship between them, i.e. between the ruler and the ruled, is like the relationship between the maker and the tool, or between the soul and the body, and between Mr. Despots and the slave. It is, of course, impossible for friendship or justice to exist in a human being's relationship with an inanimate object, or with a horse or an ox, or in a slave's relationship with a slave. This is because the master the master and the slave have nothing in common, the slave is a living tool, and the tool is an inanimate or lifeless slave, ethics to Nicomachean 8, 9. Thus, Aristotle linked the system of slavery to the form of tyrannical rule, on the basis of the nature of human relations in each of them, and here, in his opinion, the difference between the Greek and the barbarian, i.e. the non-Greek, is determined. The Greeks have the ability to rule and be governed, but the barbarians are all slaves by nature and birth. Aristotle continues his tendentious ruling, concluding that the status of the slave and the woman is the same among the barbarians because they lack the innate ability to rule, and marriage between them is merely a union between a female slave and a slave, and that the Greeks, who are naturally free, should rule the barbarians, the same thing Hegel later affirmed and called to him al Siasa 1, 1, 1252b.22. Finally, perhaps the previous explanations of Aristotle's theory of tyranny and tyranny, in addition to pointing out the stages of development of the two terms in the history of Western political thought and the comments thereon, could shed some light on our main topic, which is the tyranny of Gilgamesh or his tyranny, as a model or prototype of the Eastern tyrant in this era. The region, which is plagued by countless models and subtypes of tyrants and tyrants, it is necessary to be careful of the caveats of comparing the meaning of a term that arose in a specific cultural and religious religious context, and its meaning in another context far removed from it in its time, place, and cultural and social structures. Knowing that the discussion revolves around a circle of waiting that is far removed from Puritanism and categorical opinion. The concept of tyranny and tyranny itself suffers from an elusive duality that it has not been able to completely eliminate in the tradition of political thought in general. We begin with the question, can we describe Gilgamesh as a king who ruled his people in Uruk or was controlled by the way a master controlled his slaves? Did people accept this because they are slaves by nature and nature? Was the relationship between them and him as most theorists of tyranny and tyranny assert, devoid of every human relationship that suggests the existence of love, freedom, and respect for reason and human nature 23. In fact, the answer to these and similar questions is included in the previous pages. We talked about the manifestations of primitive or primary democracy among the Sumerians and about Gilgamesh addressing the elders and youth of Uruk on many occasions and situations and the people applauding him for his victory in adventures that he knew, or at least felt, that he had undertaken to achieve a public interest, such as bringing the wood that his country needed in addition to the private interest, which is achieving glory, fame, and immortality of the name. 
All of this confirms the presence of the other in Gilgamesh's life in some form, no matter how slight, and that he was not abolished or denied, as is the case in the relationship of the master with his slaves. Then, the obedience of the ancient Sumerian and Semitic to his religious and worldly ruler, who is charged by the gods with implementing the laws and tablets sent down from heaven, is unlikely to be the obedience of the slave to his master arising from fear, inherent to every possible tyranny and is most likely to be based on a stable belief in the necessity of submitting the duties of obedience to the gods in heaven and for their rulers and kings on earth and in human cities even if this did not prevent, as the Babylonian wisdom texts attest, the rise of some protesting or rebellious voices, questioning and doubting the usefulness of divine wisdom and appreciation, with the spread of evil and injustice in the world and the approaching of their followers to the abyss of blasphemy and then their retreat. About it before falling into it, most of these texts texts date back to the first millennium BC. In the end, we must look at the problem of freedom within the framework of the Babylonian civilization and in other ancient civilizations in the Near and Far East from a different perspective than its abstract meanings and embodied realizations in the Greek-Roman Christian civilization, so as not to condemn it in a small way on the basis of rational standards and principles of freedom. Personality, which first took root in a prosperous and short period of democratic life under city-state society. We must not forget that behind the Western view of civilization and humanity in the East is a long history of fierce wars and fierce aggression, from the Greco-Persian wars to the clash with Muslims from the era of conquests to the Crusades until the Ottomans and the successive colonial campaigns against the East, add to this that the obedience of the Eastern and Semitic in particular to his divine rulers is fundamentally different from the obedience of a slave to his master, because it does not emanate from fear and horror, but from awe and reverence. Just as talking about the nature of Eastern slavery condemns the one who says it above all else, and labels him as ignorant, fanatical, and narrow-minded. Moreover, there is not a lack of fair people who have continued to confront it, at least since the Age of Enlightenment until today. Point 24. Why did the people of Uruk borrow their gods from Gilgamesh? A careful reading of the epic in addition to what we mentioned before confirms that their complaint was an expression of their dissatisfaction with his abuse of the authority granted to him by the gods and their revealed laws, and his being carried away by his whims and whims, in a way that is inconsistent with these laws. This means that the complaint was not an expression of their rejection of that authority, nor of the person of Gilgamesh himself, as evidenced by the fact that they complain of him and glorify him in the same breath as previously said. But they have had enough as we say today of his injustices that are not approved by the gods who rush to respond to their request, that is, from his tyranny in the bad sense of the word, or rather from his tyranny. Perhaps his supplications and prayers to his gods Shamash and Lujal Benda, in addition to the warnings that Enkidu was giving against the abuse of power, attest to the presence of a hidden motive in himself that reminds him of his human third and of the pledger contract concluded between him and the gods not to be excessive in his tyranny and tyranny. However, Gilgamesh was purified of his tyranny in the way I tried to portray and justify on the previous pages. Perhaps the reader is not convinced by this attempt and responds to it by saying, but what you call purification is in fact defeat, failure, and brokenness. The truth is that I am not fanatical about this opinion or any other opinion. A sympathetic reading of the text and experiencing it from within and within its context in different conditions allows for more than one reading but my living with the text has formed in me an intuition that resembles certainty that Gilgamesh like other wise men and visionaries of our ancient, medieval, and modern civilization is standing there far away, pointing to us. In the midst of adversity, he says, beware of tyranny, beware of tyranny 25. In the end, it remains for us to return to the questions that we posed at the beginning, and the truth is that they do not expect answers as much as they impose duties, not only on the enlightened intellectuals and specialized scholars among the people of our nation, but on everyone who belongs to this land and this civilization, and everyone who feels with the recurring tragedies of tyranny that we are committing suicide. If the passive voice is permissible here, or we are lured into committing suicide with our own hands, these duties are represented by other questions that may be prompted to answer by participating in actions, not words. Is it time for us to move beyond the legacy of tyranny in our ancient, medieval, and modern history, with another legacy in which we get rid of the nightmare that has haunted our souls for thousands of years, and continues to surprise us from time to 
to time, if Gilgamesh provides an example for the tyrant who was purified from his tyranny, then how is purification accomplished in our circumstances and the circumstances of our time? How and when is the determination to start from the beginning of the beginning which is freedom, valid, if tyranny tyranny tyranny, or whatever you want to call it, is a non-temporal structure as linguists say that has overshadowed our history, or an archetype that has been deposited in the buried layers of our collective unconscious, and continues to announce itself throughout all levels, and it rears its head even in our daily behavior. Is there a way to monitor it and trace its roots, branches, and bitter fruits in its manifestations, texts, and expressions of our historical self, in preparation for amputating his malignant tumor? questions and questions that we asked at the beginning, and we can add more to them at the end. If my interpretation is correct, then Gilgamesh's purification of his tyranny was the ancient beginning that was waiting for us to renew it with the language and tools of the age. It was the original spring in which we could sink, and with its water, we could wash away the sins of the past and the adversities of the present, and emerge from it purified to face the future. Is it time for us to we resolve to purify ourselves, and overcome the legacy of tyranny with the legacy of freedom? Do we learn from adversity, start from the beginning, achieve it in action, and embody it through work and civilizational building? Footnotes. 1. You can find a complete translation of this story by the Sumerian Samuel Noah Kramer in the well-known book by Professor James Pritchard and his colleagues, Ancient Near Eastern Texts in Relation to the Old Testament, 3rd edition, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1969 AD. Pritchard, James B., ed., Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament, 3rd edition. Princeton Aniv, Press, 1969. To the Epic of Gilgamesh was retranslated by Albert Schott and provided with notes and comments. It was revised and completed by Wolfram von Soden, Stuttgart Reclam, 1958, and the Arabic translation by the writer of the lines and the review by Dr. Ani Abdul Rauf on Akkadian, in Press. Das Gilgamesh Epos New Ubersetzt und mit Amerkungen, Versehen von Albert Schott, Dirch Jessahin und Nergans von Wolfram von Soden, Stuttgart Reclam, 19. 58. 3. He who transgressed the trial of Gilgamesh al Hilal book, Cairo, Dar al Hilal, number 494, February 1992. 4. The Roots of Tyranny, Readings in Ancient Texts, and Looks at the Roots of Tyranny World of Knowledge Series, December 1994. 5. The study of Gilgamesh receives remarkable attention from Assyriologists in all their fields of specialization. Suffice it to say that they held their seventh conference for it alone in Paris in 1958 AD, and their research on it was published in a book entitled, Gilgamesh and His Miraculous Story, compiled by Paul Gorelli and published in Paris in 1960 AD on the occasion of the International Meeting of Assyritics. Gilgamesh et sa legend etudes resualise l'occasion de la vie im rencontre assyriologique internationale, Paris, 1958 Paris, 1960 ed. by Gorelli. 6 See the epic, first tablet, first column, eighth line, L1, V1, S8, and reference will be made later to these symbols in my translation of the epic in all quotations. 7 This is what Professor Firas al Sawa called it in his translation of the epic Treasures of the Deeps, a reading of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Damascus, Al Arabi Printing and Publishing, 1987 AD. 8 Drive, Fadl Abdul Wad Ali, The Epic of Gilgamesh Alam al Fikr, Volume 6, Issue 1, June 1985, page 43. 9. See James Fraser's book, Folklore in the Old Testament Part 1, translated by Dr. Nabila Ibrahim, reviewed by Dr. Hassan Zaza, Cairo, Egyptian General Book Authority, 1972, pages 62-72. 10. A person comes to awareness of the necessity of death by participating in a death experience. One of the most important of these experiences is the death of a dear person, friend, or beloved companion. See Jack Shoran, Death in Western Thought, Translated by Kamal Yusuf Hussein, reviewed and presented by Dr. Imam Abdul Fattah Imam Kuwait, World of Knowledge, Issue 76, April 1984, p. 19, minus 21. In fact, Gilgamesh had known death before that completely, whether in terms of his being an extremely oppressive tyrant, who imposed it or practiced it himself on other members of his people, two-thirds of whom were not as divine as he was, or in terms of his belonging to a civilization whose wisdom states that death is inevitable and absurd. Fear of him. If a person has to die, let him die a death of glory and pride on the battlefield or fighting a worthy opponent. This is indicated by what we have previously quoted from Gilgamesh's words to Enkidu when he touched upon his failure to attack Humbaba, the monster of the forest, as is indicated by Enkidu's sorrow over his death and his bed, not on the battlefield. 11 E. Frankfurt and others pre-philosophy. 
translated by Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, Beirut, Arab Foundation for Studies and Publishing, 1980, page 251. 12 Drive, Muhammad Khalifa Hassan Ahmed, Myth and History in the Eastern Heritage, A Study in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Baghdad, House of General Cultural Affairs, 1988, page 161. 13 Drive, Jabala Ali Jabala, Justice and Balance in Ancient Thought, a lecture given at the College of Basic Education, Cultural Season in 1988-1989 Kuwait, 1990AD, pages 317 and after. 14 See the Babylonian Wisdom Texts in the Translation of, C. Lambert in his book Babylonian Wisdom Literature, London, Clarendon Press, 1960 AD, as well as in the translation of the author of the lines in his book The Roots of Tyranny, and in his article about one of these texts, which is the dialogue between the master and the slave, Owl Bay and Magazine Kuwait, Issue 27, 1988 AD, pages 64-81. W. G. L. Embert, Babylonian Wisdom Literature, London, 1960. 15 Myth and History in the Eastern Heritage, page 161. 16 Treasures of the Deep, page 224. 17 Taha Bakr, The Epic of Gilgamesh, 4th edition, Baghdad, 1980, page 151. 18 Drive, Ahmed Abu Zaid, Epics as History and Culture Kuwait, Alam Al Fikra Magazine, Volume 16, First Issue, June 1985, page 14. 19 To my knowledge, there is no evidence of its heavenly or earthly legitimacy for this right. Perhaps this explains the protest of the people of Uruk against him and their complaint to the Council of Gods about Gilgamesh's oppression and oppression of them and their sons and daughters. 20 Dictionary of the History of Ideas, Volume 2, edited by Philip B. Wiener, pages 118, The Matter of Tyranny. Dictionary of the History of Ideas, Studies of Selected Pivotal Ideas, Editor-in-Chief Philip P. Wiener, Vol. 11, Despotism, New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, page 118. 21 William of Ockham, circa 1300 to 1349 AD, tried to clarify Aristotle's concept of tyranny and tyranny. During his talk about systems of government, which are generally divided into systems of control for the public good and others for the benefit of the ruler alone. The correct monarchy is one in which the king rules to achieve the good of the whole and in which the subjects enjoy natural freedom. As for the other two types of royal rule, which are autocratic rule and tyrannical rule, they both seek to achieve the benefit of the king alone. The difference between them is that the tyrannical king exercises his tyranny over slaves who submit to him with their consent, while the bad king rules in accordance with the law that grants him absolute authority, but he turns into a tyrant when he begins to rule his subjects against their will to achieve his own benefit. If he begins to achieve his interests according to their desire and satisfaction, he turns into a tyrant. William Lewis of Ockham, Dialogues, Section 3, First Letter, Book 1, Chapter 6, translated by Ewart Lewis, Political Ideas in the Middle Ages, London, 1954 AD, Part 1, pages 301 to 302, from the previously mentioned Dictionary of the History of Ideas, page 3. 22 Aristotle adds another factor to differentiate between the Greek and the barbarian, which is the climate factor. The peoples who live in cold countries, especially in Europe, are energetic in spirit, even if they lack ingenuity and intelligence. As for the Asian peoples, they possess ingenuity and intelligence, but they lose the spirit. Therefore, they are submissive slaves. If the Greeks had possessed the spirit and intelligence, they would have been qualified to rule other peoples and at the same time have remained free. Politics 7, 6, 327b. Some commentators have suggested that Aristotle advised his student Alexander the Great that the Greeks should be ruled by the rule of a leader, hegemon, and the barbarians should be ruled by the rule of a master despots in his lost letter to Alexander Politics, translated by Ernest Parker New York 1946 AD, page 40, about Dictionary of the History of Ideas, Volume 2, edited by Philip B. Fenner, page 3. 23 Although Gilgamesh is a religious ruler committed, in terms of religious tradition at least, to carrying out divine commands and laws, the complaints of his subjects demonstrate that he was not the model ruler faithful to the pledge he had made to the gods as both high priest and human ruler. Therefore, the meaning of the people of Uruk's temptation for his arbitrary behavior could be that he ruled by fear or intimidation. He wakes us up at night with the beating of drums, etc., and that his absolute authority was not the authority of divine laws, but rather the authority of his own will, that took hold as Hegel says about tyranny. He replaced the law philosophy of right 278, so that his rule was, as Hegel also put it, 
The Rule of the Unfettered Will of One Man, Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences, 544, but was he happy to obtain by force what the ruler gets, acceptable to gods and people contentment, love, and freedom, is it understood from the complaint that begins the first column of the first tablet in the epic that the people are praying to the gods to reform him and stop him harming them, not to enslave him or put another ruler in his place. This seems to be the meaning and significance of the complaint together in the context of a religious civilization, based on the absolute obedience of the governed to the divine ruler, because his obedience is obedience to the gods themselves, despite what is also understood by them to be that in the words of Rousseau in his book, an essay on the origin of inequality between humans and its foundations, he has trampled on the laws and on the people, transformed legitimate authority into arbitrary authority, and subjected his subjects to his will and whims. And he broke the religious and social contract between him and the gods and humans. It seems that Gilgamesh himself was not happy with his actions, which were based on force rather than on legitimacy and truth, and that his conversion to altruism after obtaining the plant of immortality, and then after losing it, was a kind of atonement accompanying purification. If he were not a tyrant in one or all of the previous meanings, neither transformation nor purification would have any meaning. 24 See what has already been said about Voltaire and Debrin. 25 It is difficult to enumerate the names of these warners and forecasters from Aber, the eloquent farmer, and the wise men of Sumer, Babylon, and Zarka al Yamama, to Salah Abdul Saber, Amaldunkal, Khalil Hawi, and all those with vision and foresight who pity our present and our future.